Hello. Second Timothy chapter four. Yep. Second Timothy chapter four. We said Eric. We good? Yeah. Second Timothy chapter four. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship. We commit this time to you and your service. We come to you in Jesus' name. We pray your blessing, your anointing, your very presence and peace upon our fellowship, upon this meeting. We pray that this word would go forth with clarity and understanding and plant in our hearts and minds truth and life and light which is found in your word. We thank you for blessing our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Amen. And over the last weeks and months, we've been look, really looking at uh, 2 Timothy uh, regarding the church and regarding what's going on in the church and, and, uh, and how the, you know, when we, we took up here, it says that they will not endure sound doctrine. They, you know, is the church people, they will not endure sound doctrine. They'll not put up with it. They'll not strive with it. Will not stand against what's 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 sound, you know. And it goes on to say that they'll not not only not endure, but they'll turn away from the truth. They'll actually turn completely away from the truth, and they'll they'll turn to men that will satisfy their itch, their ear itch, their you know what they're hearing. In other words, they they'll go where they'll they'll be fed something from the pulpit on what they want to hear. And we've always looked at it from that standpoint of the congregation, you know, not wanting to hear something that might cause uh, a feeling of conviction, a feeling of condemnation, a feeling of what they don't think is, is right, even though the Bible says it. And they, they want teachers, and it says they heap to themselves teachers, which means their churches are larger because they're heaping to themselves teachers that are, are teaching them something after their own lust. If you look at it, it says, <coughs> verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust and desires, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And we've looked at this several times over, over the weeks. Today I want to look at the other side of the coin here. Because Paul charges Timothy in verse 1. He says, I charge you. I could say, I order you. I'm telling you <coughs> that Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. In other words, I'm telling you something that he will deal with when he comes back or when you stand before him. He said, preach the word in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So not only does he say, here's what's going to happen in the church, particularly the end time church, but he tells them, here's an order from God, and trust me, God will judge both the congregation and the pulpit when he comes back. You preach the word. In other words, hold sound doctrine. Don't, don't be persuaded by, by what people are saying or what people are doing. Hold on to truth. Hold on to what the word of God says. Don't change from it. It says, be ready in season, out of season. And that means you always be ready, always be prepared to preach or teach or answer or counsel the word, which means keep the word in the center of your heart. Keep the word in the center of your thinking so you're always prepared. You know, preach the word in season, out of season, right? Then it says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. In other words, criticize, correct, warn, and bring true sound doctrine. Don't be afraid to criticize. Don't be afraid. He's talking to a leader here. He's saying, don't be afraid to criticize, to correct, to reveal what's wrong, to reveal what's being taught wrong. Don't be afraid to bring the word of correction, Timothy. That's what he's telling him there, right? Reprove, rebuke, 
exhort. He says exhort, which means lift people up while you're doing it. Teach them, show them the word. The best way to do this is to have the word do the teaching for you, right? Rather than your opinion, if the word says it, let them read it. And, 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 then, it, and then it goes down in verse 5. It says, but watch thou in all things. In other words, watch yourself in everything you do. Endure affliction. Endure the society. Endure the culture that's coming against you. Endure what is wrong in the culture. Don't be afraid to stand against it. Don't be afraid to preach against it. Don't be afraid to criticize it. Don't be afraid to come against it in the word. Amen? It says, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So now when you look at this, he's really, you know, because we've been looking at the other side of the coin. We've been looking at churches being built that are pleasing men, right? We're looking at churches that are being built where it's comfortable for men, where it's comfortable for them to come in. There's nothing that would convict them or there's nothing that would, you know, that would cut against them. He's telling Timothy, give sound doctrine. Don't worry what they think. Give sound doctrine. Don't be afraid to criticize. Don't be afraid to lay it out there. Don't be afraid to give it out there. Now, you have to understand, if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, just to understand what's going on in 2 Timothy, in verse 4, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. In other words, Paul saying uh, to Timothy, I'm really looking forward to seeing you, and I'm, I'm, I'm mindful. I understand what's going on in your life, okay? He says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that it's in thee also. He says, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee, by the putting out of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Be, thou, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. Amen. Who hath saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen? So here we see, here we see, Paul's writing him and he's saying, listen, remember, remember the time that I laid hands on you. And evidently the, the gift of the Holy Spirit came into him, right? When, when, the, when the Spirit of God came into him, it must have been a, 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 a dramatic event. He must have burst out and prayed in the Spirit or, or something happened but he's saying you have to remember the episodes in your life where God moved and you could see God's hand moving. He said, don't be ashamed of the testimony. Don't be ashamed of me, his preacher, his teacher. He says, endure affliction. In other words, don't be ashamed of the word of God. Don't be ashamed of what it says. Paul, later on in the chapter, if you look at verse 12, verse 12 it says, for the which cause I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. Here he is again. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed unto me against that day. Hold fast, Timothy, the form and sound words which thou hast heard of me in the faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thy keeping by the Holy Ghost which dwelt in us, for this thou knows that all they that are in Asia be turned away from me or abandon me, whom are for, for, for Ligulus and Hermogenes. So here we see, I want you just to understand what's going on here in Second Timothy. In Second Timothy, there's this immense pressure on anybody that would stand for Christ. Uh, you know, on anybody that would stand for his word. So there's this immense pressure on him. And Paul tells him, don't be ashamed, kid. Don't be ashamed. Hold fast. Know who you're doing it for. Know what you're doing. And remember the miracle that occurred in your life. Okay? 
So here we have this counterculture, counter society message from Paul to Timothy because the herd was leaving the church. You see that? Everybody, he said, everybody fled from me in Asia. They all bailed. He said, don't let, they're bailing from you, but don't let it change you. Stand fast, hold fast, know that Jesus eventually will judge. Just continue on. Amen? So the message today, since we've been talking about the church, it's the Bible tells us to go into the world and preach the gospel. We're going to look at both of those scriptures. And I want to look at today how much of the church or our gathering do we change or dedicate to the unsaved? How much of our gathering together as a church do we alter or change to accommodate somebody who doesn't know Jesus so it becomes friendly for them to come into our congregation? Okay? So, so you know, because people are, are salvation-minded, and we should be, but what is the church's calling and purpose? Okay, because I, I want to look at that because we need to understand, you know, if we make the church an evangelical tool, we're changing the dynamics of the service to accommodate somebody who doesn't know what we know. Right? We're making it comfortable for them. So we really have to take a look at it because our experience and what a church is is purely based on our life experience. Right? We weren't going to church in the, some of them may be going to church in the 50s, but I mean, if you go back 50, 60, you know, go back 70 years, 80 years, I mean, church in its own culture, you know, manifested itself continually for 2,000 years, really up until 1960, where churches changed dramatically, where you began to see non denominational churches pop up and different kinds of services come to be. And I'm not saying anything bad about anybody or anybody that's doing the work for Christ. It's I want to purely look at what is our calling and what are we supposed to do at church. Right? Is that fair? First let's look at the, at the calling, the Great Commission. Go over to Mark chapter 16. There's two different scriptures, one in Mark, one in Matthew, with the Great Commission that, that I want to look at. Verse 15 says, He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. And so we see here, before Jesus was taken up, this is his ascension, not his resurrection. Before he was taken up into heaven, he told them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. You preach, they're either going to believe you and be saved or not believe you and be damned, right? Then he goes on to say, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They'll walk in acts of miracles. They'll do miracles. They'll lay hands on the sick. They'll, they'll, they'll go into, you know, uh, destitute places. There'll be special protections for them. There'll be all kinds of activity of heaven working with man to reveal God. And here's the thing. I want you to understand. Not only is the command there to go into the world, but the, but the, but the association with that command is that the Holy Spirit would open the eyes of the people. It's not man opening the eyes of the people. It's not man's entertainment, marketing plan, 
marketing strategy that will open the eyes of the people. It's the Holy Spirit that changes the hearts. Do you see the Great Commission? Go into the world. These are going to follow you. People are going to receive you. I, and I'm going to tell you where, where I first picked this up. You know me. I used 10 scriptures tonight, right? I have friends that are evangelists that use a half a scripture and they move hearts. Thousands of people come forward. I don't understand it at all. But they come forward because they're anointed of God. You see, it's not... You know, me as a teacher, I'm looking at it, how did you convince anybody with what you just said? Billy Graham only had about seven or eight sermons. I mean, he just went over and over and over. When you, when you back up from it and looked at it, I mean, he taught a lot of different sermons. I'm not putting them down. But he really hit it hard with, you know, five, six, seven, eight sermons, and people came because that's God's calling. Mine's a teacher. So when I teach, it pierces your heart. When your pastor teach, teaches, it pierces your heart and your mind to move you, right, as, as a shepherd would move you. But understand something. The Great Commission is tied with us believers going into the world, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to change minds and hearts for the kingdom of God. Amen? If you go over to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, literally all authority, is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so here we see something a little bit different in that he says the same thing, go into the, all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them. He said the same thing, right? Preach. But here he says, teach them to observe all things whichever, whatsoever I've commanded you. In other words, teach them to grow in the word of God. Teach them to grow in the things of God. And so we, we ask ourselves, this is our commission. So some have taken this, and, and we have to ask ourselves, how much are we going to change our gathering together as saints to accommodate the unsaved and to make them feel comfortable in our congregation? Or what will we do to alter the service to accommodate the unlearned and unsaved to handle this commission? Because this commission does not say to bring them to church. I'm going to show you that. It says for you to go to them. It doesn't say bring them in. Okay. In fact, go over to, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The best way to look at, at this, because when I, when I got this in my heart, you know, because when I, when I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to look at, just so you guys know, I'm, tr I'm praying because we're desperately losing this battle in our nation. Desperately. You know, today Pixar and Disney announced the first animated movie with a lesbian couple. This is animated for kids. You know, we're, we're losing this battle... The culture is changing right under our eyes, and there's a, per there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it, and, and, and uh, today's message will shine some light on it, but there's a reason for it, because we haven't dealt right in our churches. And, and so here in 1 first first Corinthians, I want you to see how Paul told the Corinthian church to deal with sin in the church, okay? So I want to go verse by verse through the through the chapter. Verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Now, circle among you. He, what's he talking about? He's talking about the church. That there's fornication among you and such fornication as is not as so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, let me under, explain this. A man slept with his stepmother. Okay, according to the commentary behind it. He says, and you are puffed up 
and have not rather mourned, listen, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Okay, so Paul's saying, listen, you guys make a joke of it. You're puffed up about it. You should mourn, and this guy should not be going to church at your church. He should be removed. Now, the commentaries to this, because there's several, is this man is probably prominent within the church. He's probably notable within the church, okay? So I, I, I don't want, you know, we're not throwing everybody out, but I want you to see how, he, how Paul addresses this. He goes on to say, For verily, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have I judged already, as though I, have, I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we see him say something. We see him say, not only do I want you to deal with this, because this guy probably is in leadership, I want you to deal with it publicly from the pulpit in front of everybody. Do you guys see that? There's a reason for it. Understand, there's, it's not to shame. It's to shame him, yes. It goes on to say to shame him. But it's also to teach and to instruct. Okay? So he goes on. Look at what he goes on to say. Now he's delivering him to Satan for what? The destruction of his body that his spirit may be saved. In other words, he wants to put an end to it. But what is Paul doing? He's taking authority as a spiritual head of this congregation because he started the church. He says, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, which is sin, leaveneth the whole loaf, or lump. Purge, therefore, the old leaven, that they may be a new lump, as you are, you are unleavened or without sin. For even Christ, our Passover, was sanctified. Therefore, let us keep the feast, or a gathering together, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Strong language, isn't it? But let me tell you what he's saying. Let me, let me melt it down for you. He's saying a little sin like this affects the whole group. A little leaven leavens the whole congregation. Why? Because we're compromising. We're allowing compromise. So we're telling people in the church, right, that we're going to allow this to go on under our noses as, as it's well known. And because of that compromise, there's no clear boundaries on what's expected of us when we come together as a church. Do you guys see that? So, so when, we, when, we, when we allow this, we affect the whole group. So our attitudes toward it now are that sin or our sin is not that big a deal. Right? Because we're allowing this. Our leadership's allowing this. Paul says, no, gather together and throw him out in front of everybody. In other words, draw clear boundaries on what's expected. Because what we're doing is we're telling the kids, we're telling the young adults, we're telling families that they can live in their sin without any consequence. Now, all of us have sin. Understand that. I'm not saying we're all perfect. Here's the difference. We're striving to be better. Right? And when it comes to fornication or homosexuality or adultery within the congregation, the pastor has to deal with it. The pastor has to deal with it. Do you understand? So, But Paul's attitude is purge it from among you. Okay? In verse 9, he says something. He says, I wrote you an epistle not to company with fornicators. In other words, don't keep company with them. Look at verse 10. It's a very important verse. It's just not yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world 
or with the covetous, or with extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye need to go out of the world. In other words, you don't completely separate from the world completely. You don't bring the world into the church. Because how else would you save others? He's saying otherwise you've got to leave the world. Hold your finger here. Look what Jesus said. Go over to John. Hold your finger. We're going back. John 17. When Jesus is praying for them, it says, I have given them thy word, verse 14, I have given them thy word that the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not, verse 15, that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil, or you could say the evil that is in the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them or separate them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. Separate them. For thou hast sent me, look at, thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also will send them into the world. Doesn't You see, it's we go out into the world. We don't bring the world home for dinner. You get it? It says, for, for their sakes I sanctify myself that, that he through truth Neither pray I for these alone, but for also for them that shall believe on me through what? Their words. Okay, here's what's supposed to happen. When the unbeliever comes into the church, they're supposed to see what the Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts and our minds, and how dedicated we are, and how boundaries are drawn. And, and so if we try to accommodate them all the time, what we're doing is we're compromising to accommodate a group of people that are looking for what we have, but they can't see what we have until they get closer to us. So there's a balance to this. You know, there's a balance to getting someone, you know, I love that 300 people who come forward at a big church and give their life to Jesus Christ, but we got to take them on a journey that shows them clear boundaries. Without clear boundaries, you have people that will not stand against sin in the culture, and that's what we have. That's what we have. We have people who are tolerant of behavior and not standing out and speaking against it because they're ashamed. Okay? When they're supposed to be going to a church where they know they have 1,200 people behind them that think the same way, when they go out into the world, they realize they don't, that person's not the end-all, be-all. They have 1,200 people thinking just like them. But we're not there today because we've moved from moving of the Holy Spirit to entertaining people. We've moved from not wanting to offend or bring somebody to a place of conviction so we've changed our service to accommodate something that would make it friendly for them. And in doing so, we've compromised the whole congregation. Do you guys understand? Do you understand? That's, Paul's telling Timothy, hold on to it. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke. What they need to see is they need to come in and how will they know how to move in the Spirit? Pray in the Spirit. Pray for the sick and trust the Holy Spirit without seeing the Holy Spirit. Yeah. How do you do that? Do you guys see, do you understand how this, this burden is on me? Because the church has gravitated ever so slowly to be completely salvation-minded because it's numbers and not heart-minded, which doesn't have to do with numbers. You need numbers, you know, to, to, to have programs and to do things for a church, right? But at the same time, you got to have your kids seen. There's a clear line drawn. We don't deal with this. We're not going to coddle you. God doesn't coddle you. God, this is the, he, he told the, the, the adulterous woman, what did he tell her? He said, I'm not condemning you today. I'm forgiving you today. But 
go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. You know, so as Paul's writing here, so in verse 10, he says, I don't want to take you out of the world. You can't completely decouple from the world, but don't keep company with the world, right? Go into it, preach, teach, let your light shine, right? Remember, let your light shine, be the salt of the earth. Let the word shine. He says, but no, I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or adulterer, or a railer, or a drunkard, or extortioner, with such a one, do not eat. Do not have fellowship with him. For what, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among you the wicked persons. You guys see that? Understand that? Go over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, walk in love as Christ have also loved us and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. In other words, be followers of God as dear children, walk in love even as Christ also have loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Do you guys see that? Let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather give thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be ye therefore not a partaker with them. Do you guys see that? You know, now this is the same book, if you remember we taught on context, go over to chapter 2 of Ephesians. In verse 4 it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding richness of his grace and his kindness through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Same chapter, saying that while you were a sinner, Jesus died for you. And that your resume doesn't matter. You can be Hitler, and if you change your, your heart, God will accept you. Right? But in the same letter, he says, clean it up, and don't let the sin be among you. Do you follow? So when we're among each other, we have to teach these very clear lines and boundaries about what God expects of us. Because left to ourselves, we will paint our own boundaries. And we'll make our own commandments. And they'll accommodate our lifestyle. Right? <coughs> we can't do that. Let me show you something. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 23, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup in the New Testament, in my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Right? Communion. 
He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, for so let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep or die young. For if you would judge yourselves, you should not be judged. But we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Amen? And I'm showing you this because I want you to see the gravity of something that we do often. Communion. Something we do in church, right? Some do it once a month, some do it every week. Some do it maybe less frequently. But the weight and gravity of what Paul's teaching here is, I mean, how many times have you taken communion where the pastor said, let's examine your hearts right now, bow your heads, examine your hearts, and get right with God before we pass this plastic cup with grape juice in it and this, you know, all injection mold in one little holder now, you know, and, and take communion of the Lord. The weight and gravity of this tells me that me as a leader, I have to tell you to get right with God, otherwise you're going to get sick, you're going to be weak, and you're going to die young. This is judgment, isn't it? These are who? These are safe folks. This is in church. I'm not trying to be in condemnation or conviction. What I'm trying to show you is when we get together as a church family, we're supposed to be one heart, one mind, one soul, working together, cleaning up our lives, our minds, and our hearts. And the only way that happens is that we teach it from the pulpit that there's a downside to our actions. We don't make it convenient for everybody because we, we want to keep them engaged. You know, I, 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 when you look at, if you go over to uh, Acts chapter 4, are you guys getting what I'm, the, the, what I'm trying to get across? Acts chapter 4, verse 17, it says, But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them. These are the priests talking. They should not henceforth tell no man in his name. And they called them and commanded them that they should not speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all the men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went where? To their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had, had said to them. Jump down to verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Listen to this. And the multitude of them that believed were one heart, one soul, neither said any of them that ought the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common, for with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all, Neither were there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them, notice plural, they got rid of their excess, brought the price of the things that were sold, laid it down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to every man according to his need. Okay, what the world is supposed to think about this? They're out in the world preaching the gospel. 
While they're preaching the gospel, they lay hands on somebody and somebody's healed. The chief priest calls them in and said, you can't do that. We don't want this you know, religion growing. He said, I'm not, I can't change. I'm not going to, I'm going to tell people what I've seen, what I heard, and what I know. He gets released from them because he was in prison. He gets released. He goes back to his own company and they pray. And the Bible says they're one heart, one mind. Okay, now here, here's what's supposed to happen. The unbeliever is supposed to come in and see this unwavering commitment to serve Jesus Christ in his word. They're supposed to see men and women that have fully devoted their hearts, their minds, their families, their lives, their businesses, and everything they have for the glory of their King Jesus who died for them. They're supposed to see an unwavering commitment on our part, and then they're supposed to see the Holy Spirit move in hearts and minds of us with the power of the Holy Spirit to convince them that Jesus Christ is real. And what they should do is the perfume of the Holy Spirit in us should move their hearts to want what we have. We don't have to put on a stage production to do it. Amen. They've got to see it. Do you, do, you, do you guys see? They have to see that, that moving of the Holy Spirit in us. When they see people that are fully committed, they're gonna, their eyes are going to open and see there's a group of people that are uncompromised in their thinking. Because you have to understand, uh, if you go back in time, I was saved in the early 70s, right? I mean, in, in the late 70s, early 80s, right? Where I really connected with God. Back then, this is what was taught. Churches were not secret. You walked in, you got white knuckles if you were a Catholic. I mean, I, I, they said in the first row, I, I had white knuckles. I was scared. These people were scaring me. But, I, but I'll tell you what, I went back. Why? Because they answered questions. God moved in my heart. God moved in my mind. God moved. And it's not bad to be Catholic. I'm not saying it's bad to be Catholic. I'm just saying they never picked up a Bible and I never learned anything. Right? Like I'm learning tonight. And so I went on a journey to find out how, what, where, when, and why. Because I knew there was something more. I seen these people that I respected raising their hand and praising God and thanking him for, for things in their life. And I had no idea about that life until God started exposing me to it. And as he exposed me to it, I fell in love with Jesus. Just like you, right? We all have a different way in. But I can't tell a friend of mine that, that is still trapped in religion or trapped in his own thinking, I can't compromise for him. i got to tell him exactly what's going on. I'd be doing him a disservice, and I wouldn't love him if I did tell him the truth. Because that's what it is. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus, he said, sell, sell all that you have, come and f pick up your cross and follow me. The Bible said Jesus loved him with that advice. Right? He left. He didn't stick around at church. He left. But the Bible said Jesus loved him. He wasn't out to please him. He wasn't out to get his next check. He wasn't out to sell him anything. He was saying, you want, a, you want eternal life? You want Jesus Christ? Then here's what you have to do. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. The first two commandments are the, the heavier commandments, right? Jesus said on these two commandments hang all the word of God and the prophets. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, right? I can tell you with all your money, with all your family, with all, every minute of your day. How does that happen? It doesn't happen because I sell you the way I would sell Amway. It happens because you see something deep in the core of you that speaks to you, and it's called the voice of God. Okay, I can't do it. All I can do is preach the gospel and teach. It's the Holy Spirit that moves in the heart and mind. These guys weren't selling their properties and laying them down at the apostles' feet without having a complete trust in what Jesus did for them, and we're all in for him. Amen? 
You know, and today people squeeze their money, squeeze it, the paint comes off, pulling it. You know, when you, when you come down to it, God owns everything you have anyway. You, you die tomorrow, let me tell you, you're as naked the day you die as when you're born. Doesn't matter, your balance sheet really doesn't matter. It matters to everybody you leave behind, but it doesn't matter to you. You're going to stand before God. You're going to say, what did you do with your time on earth? What did you do? See, we have to change this. We, 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 we can't... What's, what we're sending, if you take all of the messages, we're sending mixed signals. We're telling people of the love of God, and when you take all of the love language in Scripture, it really has to do with His people, not the whole world. Right? It's, he loved the whole world, so He made a doorway that whosoever believes in Him will walk through the door. Right? But, but everybody thinks that God just loves everybody. If you don't know Jesus Christ, where do you go? You're eternally separated from him. You're damned for life, for eternity. Right? Well, when somebody dies and you had the opportunity to tell them, how do you think they're going to think about you when they're dead and they have no second chance for heaven? It's like, why didn't you tell me? Why did you let me live the way I live? Why didn't you tell me the truth? Why did you play with it? That's the awesome responsibility that we have. In the Old Testament, it was the prophet, the priest, and the king, and there were great miracles. You and I are prophet, priest, and kings. We are a family of kings and priests. You have the ability to operate and function as a priest before God. To what? Lay hands on the sick. To pray for people. To pray that, that, that God would bless them and open their hearts and minds. We have to start doing this as, 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 as a church. Amen? So the question is, how much of our church gathering do we change and alter and modify to accommodate the unbeliever? Or what do we do to our services to accommodate them in mass? And the short answer is not much. The short answer is let them see it all up front. Let them know what you believe and trust God. Because I'll tell you, to do it any other way is to put the Holy Spirit in the closet. You lock them in the closet. Like a, you know, yeah, Cinderella, lock them in the closet. You don't want to. What, you don't want to see them. That you're raising your hands. That you love your God. That that you're worshiping Him. That you're pouring your heart out. That 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 you're all in because you love Jesus. People want direction. People want direction. It's up to us to preach that word and to give them that direction. Who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? He said. He told us to do it. So we go into the world. We expose them to the truth. We bring them back to an uncompromising, unwavering group of people that are all in and truly love Jesus Christ with all their heart. And we draw boundaries. We say, this is why this is not right in our culture. And this is why this isn't right in our culture. And this is why we don't believe it. You see, because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Find three or four people this week that don't have a Bible, but are Christian in their own mind. And ask them why gay marriage is wrong. Ask them why it's, you know, it's like any other sin, but our, our government has sanctioned it. Why is it wrong? And, and, and if the, the, most of them won't be able to tell you. Well, if two people love each other, why shouldn't it be? Well, if a guy married to a woman loves somebody else's wife, and they get together and they commit adultery and they love each other. What, how, why is that bad? Isn't it the same sin? It's the same sin. See, we've made it different. Society's made it different. In God's eyes, it's the same thing. It's sin. We don't change it. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. We're early today. Ten minutes early. <laughs> 
Father, we bring up some prayer requests. We pray for Ray, Father, one of our own. Father, he prays for favor and wisdom. We pray that you would give him a great sensitivity to your voice to know, Father, your wisdom, Father. Not his wisdom, not his conscience, Lord God, but your wisdom, your favor, that you would speak to his heart and mind and, Father, cause him to walk in favor, God. We pray, Father, for Jane, who has back problems. We speak to Jane's back. We say, be healed in Jesus' name. We pray for Mary Lou, who is fighting cancer. Father, we pray for Mary Lou. We, we command every cell in her body, every cancer cell in her body, to dissipate and leave in the name of Jesus Christ right now. We pray for Mark, healing from pain. Father, we come against the pain in Mark's body, and we pray his body to be whole and free in Jesus' name. We pray for Jeff's daughter who's suicidal. Lord God, we bring up Jeff's daughter in Jesus' name. Father, we pray, Father, that the oppression, the affliction, the attack by Satan, Father, to take her life. Father, we come against the spirit of darkness. We come against the spirit of depression. We break that power over this girl. And Father, we pray, God, that the narrow vision that she has that she can't live any longer, Father. We pray that you would supernaturally open her vision and her mind to see that life is worth living and that there are many people around her that love her and, Father, and, and would give their lives for her, Lord God. Father, I come against Satan in her life. God, I pray that her eyes would be open, Lord. Don't allow this, this person to be taken from us, but, Father, cause her, Father, to come out of the darkness into the light. Father, in Jesus' name. We pray for June, who has open-heart surgery uh, on uh, June 2nd. Father, we pray, Father, that the surgery goes well, without complication, without side effects. In fact, we pray that you open the arteries and cause whatever malfunction in this heart to be healed in Jesus' name. We pray for Stacy, Father, to restore a marriage. Father, to deception the disorder in her heart and mind. Father, this need of acceptance outside of the marital relationship. Father, we come against the deception, Lord God, of Satan. Father, we come against this wedge that is trying to destroy and to separate and to hinder and to cause strife. And Father, we pray, pray Father, that the perpetrator, God, that you would put him down in Jesus' name. Remove him completely in the name of Jesus and restore this marriage in Jesus' name. We pray for Alexa, newborn baby with a hip disorder. Father, we pray for Alexa. We pray that this hip, Father, would Father grow naturally. And Father, we pray that this brace would be taken off. And Father, this child would have no side effect at all in Jesus' name. Pray for Eric has drug dependency on prescription drugs. Father, we come against addiction. We break the spirit of addiction. We break it in Jesus' name and command, Father, that the spirit, Father, release Eric in Jesus' name and he be free even now at this very moment in Jesus' name. Be free from this infirmity in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you for our word today. Father, we're not ashamed of your word. We're not ashamed of the gospel. We're not ashamed, Father, to tell people truth. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that, that Father, you speak to pastors and leaders, teachers across this land, across this nation, Lord God, and there be a revival in our own pulpits, Lord God, back to the word of God and back, Father, to a place where we walk according to your word and not, Father, trying to just get people in. Father, but to get them not only saved, but walking in your word and growing with the renewing of their mind. Father, we pray that you continue to give us a word in season. Father, raise up those that would join with us, Father, to continue to get this word out. Continue to touch hearts and minds, Father, all over. Use us boldly in this time and hour. Bless our ministry, Father. Bless us. Give us a word in season every week. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.